Let's take a look at the Grob G120 TP plug and play model currently being sold by Banana Hobby. The Grob G120 TP full scale aircraft is a basic to intermediate trainer developed for both military and civilian pilot training. This plane is constructed primarily from composite materials and is a fairly new entry into the pilot training category, having first flown in 2010. The Grob G120 TP is built in Germany and is powered by a Rolls-Royce turboprop engine. The full-scale G120 TP has a 34-foot wingspan, a 28-foot length, and stands 9 feet tall at the tail. Its side-by-side -side seating and roomy cockpit allows for pilots wearing military equipment, including helmets. Its high G capacity allows for up to 6 positive and 4 negative G maneuvers. The Grob cruises at 270 miles per hour and has a published range of 667 miles. The model Banana Hobby sells is the J-Power version of the bright red Grob color scheme. It has a 1700 millimeter or 67 inch wingspan, 51 inch length, and it's powered by a brushless 4250 650 kV motor controlled by an 80 amp speed controller. They recommend a 3600 milliamp four cell battery. At 1700 millimeters, the Grob G120 TP is a bit larger than the typical 1500 millimeter models that are now quite popular. It also means that it's about one six scale model. Let's step back in time and take a look at the steps to get this thing together. Here's the model in the foam shipping crate, and uh, the shipping crate came in some heavy brown cardboard. And as you can see, each of the pieces is wrapped in a heavy plastic bag and placed in cavities in the shipping container. So, all in all, it looks like it came through the shipping process pretty good. Let's take it out and see what's inside. So as you can see, there's not a lot of parts to the model. We've got them all set up here. You've got the fuselage, the canopy comes off to get access to the radio bay, two big wings with uh, easy connectors on the ends, a couple of plastic bags with a variety of parts, the tail feathers, and the instructions. So that's pretty much it. Everything came through shipping real nice. I didn't see any dents on the foam or anything, so now it's time to spend a couple of minutes with the instructions to see what the next steps are going to be. So I've got my work table all cleared off here and uh, uh, ready to start on the assembly. It looks like it's going to be pretty straightforward. The first part of the assembly is to put hinges on the flight controls. Uh, this is a little unusual for foam models in that many times the foam is just molded thin where the aileron or the elevator meets the uh, corresponding um, superstructure and the foam is the hinge itself. With this model, they provide you with pin style hinges and ask you to cut the surfaces free from the uh, main part of the wing or, or horizontal stabilizer and insert these pin style hinges. Now that's gonna take a little longer in terms of the uh, assembly of the model, but it's gonna provide a much uh, better connection so you don't have to worry about the foam hinge tearing and coming apart. So let's take a quick look at uh, the process of doing that. So in this case, I'm going to use the horizontal stabilizer uh, and show you how to do that before going off camera and finishing up the other surfaces. So I'm going to start with my hobby knife and I'm just going to carefully run down the bead where the two pieces come together. I want to be using a sharp knife so that I don't tear the foam. Now this foam was thin enough that I wouldn't want to skip this step. It's coming apart very easily. And there are marks in the foam where the hinges are supposed to go so you don't have to worry too much about uh, aligning it when you put it back together.
So you can see I've got the two parts together. That's a nice clean edge, so I'm not going to worry about sanding it. There was sticky a couple of places where there was a little paint. And so uh, all in all, that came out very easily. So the next step is to mount the pins. Okay, the first thing I'm going to do is to use a little pin vise with a, you know, a pretty small drill bit on it to drill holes into the foam so I'm not just pushing the foam around when I try to insert the, the pin type hinges. And so it's just going to be a matter of making sure that I'm right in the middle and straight and the fact that it's red on the top and blue on the bottom or red on the top and white on the bottom uh, makes picking the center point really easy. And so I'm just going to kind of drill through that with my pin vise in each of these six holes to make room for that pin hinge. Now the next thing I'm going to do is because I sometimes get a little sloppy with the CA is I'm going to take just a little bit of Vaseline here, uh, petroleum jelly, whatever brand this is, and a toothpick and I'm going to put a little of that on the hinges where they come together on each of these in case I get sloppy with the CA. I don't want the CA to roll in there and cause the hinges to bind. It's really not for lubrication, it's really just to keep the CA from, from going in there. Go through this here, maybe position that a little better so you can see it, but it's just a matter of painting a little petroleum jelly on the hinge to ensure that they don't lock up. Now with that done, I'm just going to put a couple of little drops of uh, uh, thin gap filling CA here on each of these little holes so that when I put the hinge on it, it'll push it into the hole as the hinge goes into the hole to get a nice good coverage. Okay, got that. And now I'm going to put just a little bit of CA on the spiked portion of the hinge itself. And push it into the hole. It goes in real nice and easy. And then I'm going to turn the hinge so it's exactly perpendicular to that surface because if it's sideways or off at an angle then of course it's going to bind when the aileron or in this case the elevator goes up and down. So I've got that positioned up and down ready to go with the next one. And then here's my last one. Just insert it into the foam gently. Make sure it's vertical. So I've gone to each of the control surfaces and inserted the pin hinges on them here and here and the wings and so forth. And that's a little bit different than what the instructions called for. But in this case, uh, for the ailerons and for the elevator at least, I'm going to do it all at once. I've got the glue out, the tools out, and all that, so it's just easier to do at one time. So it's been a few minutes, and so these have all dried, and so now I'm just going to kind of do what I did before. I'm going to put a drop or two of CA in the holes that I drilled where they're marked. Okay, and then I'm just going to put a drop or two of CA on the spikes of each of these. Not much. So now I've got them all ready to go together, and so I'm just going to um, put the hinges in the various holes and push them together trying not to get CA on my fingers so I don't mar the finish. Just keep slowly moving them in. Since those holes aren't very big, the alignment needs to be good. And we get them all in there so there's not a huge gap in the surface either. And so now I've got a gap in there that's not much bigger than the hinge head itself. 
and they move nice and smooth. So now we've got them all done. Um, and I'm not going to do that to the rudder because the bottom of the rudder hinge connects to the fuselage. So I'll do that when it's connected. But uh, now with this one done, I've got the wings and the, or the elevator and the ailerons all connected. Uh, and they're all looking good. So as you can see, we've got the fuselage on the workbench right now. And the next step we're going to do is we're going to put the control horn um, on the elevator itself. Come in a, part in a bag, and so they're all pretty easy to do. And it's just three little um, ridges that will fit into molded ridges here in the foam. So I'm going to use CA to do that. CA is fine on EPO models. Remember when you put it in, you want the, um, the little part where the control rod is going to connect, you want that right over the hinge line, so you don't want to put that in backwards. It would be a pain to have to try to dig out. So that's going to be facing forward, and the instructions give you a picture of what that looks like. The next thing we're going to do is connect the vertical and, and horizontal stabilizer, and they screw in, so there's not a lot of glue here in this model, which is a good thing. Now, for the installation of the tail surfaces, there are two uh, kind of shorter screws and one longer screw. And uh, by doing some test fitting here, I discovered that uh, the rudder goes in with one long screw and one short screw, and then the horizontal stabilizer that I'm about to do now goes in with one of the uh, shorter screws. And so it's really pretty easy to do. You just kind of pop it in there, make sure you've got it set in the hole, lay it in place, and then using a Phillips screwdriver, just attach it to the airplane. Now the rudder works similarly. It's got a, a wire coming with it um, that goes to a plug coming out of the tail. And uh, this is not the control surface, it's the lights. And so you wanna make sure that you've got the red and the black in the servo extension coming from the fuselage together with the red and the black for the light switch. Plug those together, got them right. And then I'm just gonna push those, that connector down into the, the cavity there in the fuselage. And then I'm gonna move the, uh, the rudder in place to um, get it connected to the model. And so it just kind of slides into place like that, looks pretty good. And then I'm gonna reverse the fuselage here and drop the screws in to secure uh, the rudder. So again, the long one in the front and the shorter one in the rear. And we've got them both uh, secured. And so we've got the, the tail assembly uh, done. So I've taken the uh, ventral fin out of the plastic bag that it's come in. And as you can see, it's got a little snap on it. So it's not gonna glue in, it's just gonna snap in, which makes it handy because then you'll be able to get to the screws uh, that hold your um, empennage together in case there's a, a replacement that needs to be made or you need to do some other kind of repair. So that's pretty handy. So we're just gonna li line it up with the snap. And snap it in place. That was pretty easy, nothing to it. So as we've done with the other uh, control surfaces, uh, I'm gonna put a couple of drops of CA in the hole that the pin is going to go in. Now I've dry fit this first, so it uh, makes the installation a little easier. Then I'm going to put just a little, little drop of CA on each of these pins. 
and you'll notice that I installed the uh, control horn uh, the same way as I did on the horizontal stabilizer. Get the pin aligned. Try to keep my fingers out of the CA and the whole pins in the holes. And then smoothly and slowly insert them. Get a nice snug fit. And we've got them in there ready to go. And so I'm just going to set the fuselage aside now and allow time for the glue on those hinge pins to dry. Okay, the last thing we have to do here on the empennage is to connect the uh, control horns. And um, first thing I did is I used a servo tester and centered the servo so I knew what the, the center position was here on the control rod. And it was quite a ways off, and so I had to screw through a lot of the threads that were there on the end of this. The inside is a Z-bend, and so you're not going to be able to adjust it there. So I've got it screwed out, and um, or rather screwed in, so it matches the topmost hole, and the, um, the elevator is level with the edges of the horizontal stabilizer. So in this case, Try to get it here so you can see it. I'm just going to push the the little tab or the little pin through the hole, then apply a little pressure, and there it is. It snapped on, so that's good. Now you'll also see that there's a little clear uh, plasticky, rubbery piece there, and that's the that's the clevis keeper. And so I'm going to slide that up there against the control horn so that there's some pressure so that. Uh, vibration or airflow doesn't cause these two things to separate because that obviously uh, would not be a good thing. I'm going to go to the other side and do the same thing on the rudder. So we're going to turn our attentions back to the wings now. And so I've got uh, two control horns to mount here and here. And so they're just again these little three little uh, looks like the letter E and they're going to fit with uh, the control horn itself close to over the hinge line it will fit. So again, just using some CA. I'm going to drop some CA into the slots. A little on the flat surface. Do the same over on this side. For the flaps. Then I'm just going to set the control horn in place. Just like that. Now the next thing I'm going to do is get a little screwdriver and raise the control horn from each of these servos to vertical. Now I tried to use my servo tester, but this thing is wired with some special connectors and it was kind of a pain. The servos are glued in and, and the arms are screwed on. So I'm assuming that they tried to get them in centered and then just pushed them over. And so I'm going to uh, raise them. And then we're going to get ready to put the, um, the push rods on. Now the push rods, there are four of them in the package. Uh, and the one for the aileron is longer than the one for the flap. So make sure that you've got the right one uh, in mind. Now, the other thing I found is that the, uh, the holes in the, the servo arms were a little tight, a little small for the music wire here that makes up this particular push rod. Uh, and so again, I used my pin vise, put a very small bit on it, and I'm just going to enlarge the second one down. I didn't use the outside one because it was already pretty close tolerance to the edge of the arm. So by using the second one, I've got a little bit more mass there to deal with uh, the pressures of the control arm and less likelihood that it'll break through. So I've got those drilled out. And now I can put my uh, control rods on. Now this one, the control horn, is kind of aligned to the inside of the, of the uh, control arm here. 
And so I'll put the pin in that way, the Z band in on that side. And then what I'll end up doing is making sure that the, the, um, the aileron is free and it's nice and free from when we installed it. And then I'm just going to kind of match up the, the horn and the little clevis. And so I have to screw this in a little bit. It needs to, to shorten to, to meet the length. So I'll just twist this down. And then remeasure. That was pretty good, maybe out a little bit. I've got my hand against the, the aileron. It's matched up here with the flap. It looks like it'll be good. I'm going to probably end up having to take these off at some point to do some fine tuning, but this is going to get us pretty close to the ballpark. So pull it apart. And before I do that, I almost forgot to put the little rubber clevis keeper on it. So put that back back in, get it onto the, into the hole, there we go, push it in to snap, and then slide the clevis keeper little rubber band thing up over the top. Just like that. So there's really um, not too much to it, you, especially if you're using the right length on the right servo. So don't get faked out thinking that they're all the same. So I'm ready to do the flap. Now notice in this case the control arm seems to be best aligned to the control horn on the outside, whereas on the one over here was on the inside. So I'm going to push this into the hole. I've got the Z band on. Notice I have my little clevis keeper on. Check the uh, alignment. Maybe bring that out one more half a turn. And then connect it to the second to the bottom hole in this case. It'll give me some good throws, push it together, and it snaps, and then slide the little clevis keeper on. So that's pretty much it here on the bottom side of the wing, and so let me do the other side, and we'll be back and talk about the spar. Now we've got to the point where it's time to put the wing together. The spar is right here, and it fits in a pocket, and it slides in there, and I've dry fit it, and it fits really tight. So the decision that you have to make is, do you want to glue the wings together, as it suggests in the instructions, or whether you want to keep the wings as two pieces if you travel in a small vehicle? In my case, I plan to glue the wings together, and so that's what I'll be showing you now. So I've got the spar. I'm going to slide it into the channel that it comes with. I'm watching as I approach the middle. I'm not quite at the middle. So at that point, I'm going to put a little CA on the, the wood here, just enough to lock it in place. And then I'm going to finish pushing it in to the channel. Next, I'm going to put some CA on these tabs and on the flat surface of the wing here because I want it to, uh, to glue together in the center as well. Now I'm using CA and uh, you could easily use foam tack, uh, a contact type cement to put this together. That would work. It might even work better in that it's got a little flex to it. But I don't expect the wings to be moving much because it's going to be held in place with um, screws to keep it from doing much movement. So uh, I don't think the glue choice is probably going to matter too much to you. 
Now I'm going to put a little glue on this spar right where this other one is, the other wing is going to mount to, to hold it in place there. And so just with a little bit of CA like that, I'm not anticipating that the wing is going to go anywhere. So again, I'll put it in the channel, bring it together. Now we've got it where we're going to come together here. Got the wires all out of the way. And at this point, I'm just going to sit here for a while and hold it. Well, while the wing's drying, I'm going to assemble the uh, propeller, and it comes in a couple of different bags. The blades are in one bag. The plastic uh, spinner here is in another bag. Uh, and then some screws and some metal pieces that uh, you have to take a look at for a second to figure out what they all are. But really, it comes to the point where it's, you can't put it together the wrong way. Each blade has two holes on the bottom. One fits, fits over a peg, the other's for the screw. And then it, it also then has a, a, a flat side to fit in the channel where um, you need it to go. So it fits in there nice and snug. So I'm just going to push those in there. They're in there tight. They're not going to go anywhere. That one in there. And then the last one of this five-bladed propeller. Again, two holes down. That's going to be good. Uh, and then the next thing we're going to do is we're going to drop uh, some, some washers into these little holes. There are five washers and five holes, so we'll just drop them in there. And then we'll drop the <clears throat> screws down into the holes. Now, one of the metal pieces that came with this thing um, is, a, is a large silver disc. It fits there um, on the bottom here of the spinner. And you can put it so that the holes line up. And once you get one of them in there, you know, the rest of them ought to stay pretty close. So we'll get them aligned. Now I put that in with the little um, flange down, uh, perhaps you can see, and um, so it fits snugly around the plastic and uh, the little raised part is in the facing up when the propeller blades are facing down. And I'm just going to go back and tighten these in because I'm tightening them into metal so I can get them uh, pretty, pretty snug. And the last one here. So they're not going to go go anywhere, and so that's all put together. Now the last piece, my sense is that it's going to go on the the shaft from the collet on the motor, uh, and and act as kind of a washer. And then at the same time, since it's so heavy, I'm guessing that they're using it for a little nose weight. And what a great idea uh, to get some weight up in the nose than to use something right on the um, end of the prop. So. Uh, we've got that together, and now we'll uh, transfer the wings and the fuselage back to the work table and put those all together. Okay, at this point, I'm just going to connect the wings, and we're going to use these long screws to do that. Now, I dry fit this before I turned on the camera, and a couple of them didn't go in exactly the way I wanted, so I reversed the uh, fuselage, found the blind nuts on the inside, and then screwed through the blind nuts after just a little bit of filing to move a couple of little metal chips that were there. Uh, and so I've got them all ready to go through now. So uh, don't, don't be surprised if you just go from this side the first time and then end up with a little bit of trouble getting through them. I certainly did. It was just a couple of extra minutes worth of uh, work, though, to, to get those blind nuts clear and to get the threads ready to accept the screws. And so now they're going in the way they're supposed to. Just kind of doing like I do with the tire. Bring them each down tight. 
go around again and again to make sure that I get them all even and snug and they're all looking they're all looking good. So at this point I'm going to flip the model over and start working with the radio and the receiver on the inside. Okay, so I've installed the radio and uh, let me tell you just, you know, a little bit about what was going on here and a couple of a little bit of unusual uh, things. First, the ESC is there in the nose. It's an 80 amp ESC. The, the BEC part of it isn't labeled, so I'm assuming it's a switching BEC uh, outputting probably 3 amps. That's pretty typical. Uh, normally, what I like to do with larger airplanes like this, when I've got flaps and electric gear and then, you know, big servos like the ones in this airplane, I like to use a a UBAC or universal BEC or separate BEC, whatever terminology you like to use. And that's right here. And it's just, a, I think it's a Turnigy brand, a Hextronic. It's one of those from Hobby King. It's about seven bucks. It'll take eight to 26 volts. It's uh, pin selectable for six or five volts output. Uh, and it's a five amp BEC. So it gives me more power uh, and take some of the stress off of the, e the BEC in the ESC. Now, to do that, the, the wire that comes from the ESC, it's right over here, and uh, you may be able to see that there's a little black heat shrink right here, uh, and that's where I remove the power pin, the red pin from the servo connector, uh, put some heat shrink around it, bent it back, and then covered the whole thing with another piece of heat shrink and plug that into the throttle channel on the receiver. And then I've got the BEC plugged into the battery bind switch, so the receiver's powered uh, with this tab coming from the BEC, which has the little blue light on it right here. And so that's something you may want to consider doing. Otherwise, you're just going to plug this cord directly into your receiver and forget about the, the extra stuff I just mentioned. Now the other thing that was kind of odd about this is this little circuit board that makes it real easy to plug in all the connectors from the wings had a, an unusual set of output wires. Instead of having servo extensions that you would expect to see with three wires, each of the outputs except for one only had one wire. And um, as the day was getting to a close, I just kind of set it up and overnight I thought a little bit about it and it dawned on me that what it was was the signal wire coming from each of those channels and then just one of the wires coming from the circuit board had actually all three wires, the, the positive, the ground, and the signal wire. And so that was how the board got its power from just the output from the receiver from one of those wires. So when I looked at it this morning, I looked more carefully and sure enough, while the wires were different colors, they were all in the um, signal position on those servo connectors. And so when I plugged it in, everything worked the way it was supposed to, with one minor exception. And that was when I was looking at the instructions uh, for this airplane, the picture of the cockpit showed them with a Futaba uh, receiver in it. And Spectrum and Futaba receivers don't use the same pins uh, or the, for the channels. And so I looked up the uh, channel outputs for Futaba. I looked up the channel outputs for this little DMX, uh, DSMX uh, Lemon receiver that I'm using and uh, discovered there was a couple of little differences. And so the pins that were coming off the uh, circuit board were labeled, handwritten as a matter of fact, uh, one through six. And so I didn't connect them one through six. I would have had I had Futaba, but since I had Spectrum, I changed the order to match the, what I anticipated to be the Spectrum channel outs labeled on the wires. And in fact, that was exactly what it was. So when I plug this in using those numbers against the channels that are on my Spectrum uh, compatible receiver, everything worked fine first time. So one thing to be aware of. I've got the radio programmed, it's bound, you can see the red light, I've got the fail-safe set, you can see the green light, I've got a, a satellite receiver down at the other end, so I've got the polarity of this receiver going up and down, the polarity of this receiver going side to side. In both cases, I drilled a little hole through the wood, and in this case, through a little bit of the foam, 
so that the, the antenna wire is going straight down. And here you can see that the antenna wire goes through this little uh, light ply and into this cavity on the other side so the, the antennas aren't bent. So that's pretty much what I've got on the inside. I've got some space over here that I'm planning to use a um, stabilizer on, but that'll be for another video. So that's the inside. I've got this all done. And so now that I've checked the rotation of the motor, I checked the flight control directions, did all that radio programming, had to reverse a couple of uh, servo switches in my, uh, my radio, set the endpoints to get the, uh, the appropriate a throw for each of the control surfaces that are described in the instruction manual. Now I'm ready to put the propeller on and check the CG. Okay, so in putting on the propeller, you see I've got a little piece of blue painter's tape, and that was there to test the rotation of the motor. Again, with the instructions with this model, as with so many, they have you putting the propeller on before you do your radio programming, which frankly is just unsafe. And so as you've seen in this build, uh, I'm putting the propeller on after I've checked the rotation of everything, after I'm sure everything's working, because I don't want to inadvertently bump my transmitter or have something fall and end up with the airplane chasing me around the workshop. That would not be good. So I'm going to take off the tape. In this case, put the propeller on. It fits into a hexagonal mount there on the, um, the shaft. Now I'm going to assume that this piece of weight is going to go right there and that they know what they're doing. If when I balance it I find it's too nose heavy, I'll know what to, to take off first. But in this case I'm going to put it on, put it on with the bolt. Tighten it with a little wrench. Get it nice and snug. Place the nose cone over the spinner. And then it attaches here with um, a nice long bolt that screws into the front of the long bolt coming out of the collet. May have to fish around for that hole a little bit, but it's going to go in there. Pretty much just like that. So now we've got the propeller on. Now before I check the CG, I've got a couple of little just plastic uh, parts that I have to put on the airplane and we'll do that next. Okay, so we've got the plane turned around so you can see some of these parts that have to go on. The first part is a kind of an odd shaped uh, piece of foam that just slides in here just like that into the side and it goes all the way through and and I think from having flown a similar type of airplane is probably an ILS uh, glide slope antenna so in this case I'm going to put just a little bit of CA right in the middle so that when I push it through it'll be there where the uh, the, the vertical stabilizer is and it'll drag the glue into the joint and get it even, looking down from the top. So I'm good with that one. Now the next ones I'm going to do, I'm going to use hot glue. In this case, I want to use hot glue uh, because it comes off easy. And the fact is that it's going to be strong, it's flexible, but with a couple of drops of rubbing alcohol or denatured alcohol, it'll... Um, a debond, which means that if I need to make some repairs, if I break off one of these little pieces, I can easily get it off. And so that's the choice for these pieces, and that's the why for the choice. So in this case, I've got just a little bit of hot glue there, and I'm going to stick this in according, the direction according to the instructions was like this. Here is a big antenna, and so I have the antenna. I'm going to put some hot glue on the bottom and a little on the edge. Again, these don't take a lot of stress, so you know the glue's not a big deal. I'm just going to get it in there. That one looks pretty good. And then the next thing we have is we have 
what, it, what would appear at a casual glance to be four of these little um, trailing edge uh, bending things. And I'm, I'm sure they're probably static discharge lines or something similar to that. Uh, but actually there's a pair of two different kinds. Two of them have the, the little bending part coming out of the center. Uh, the other two have them coming out kind of near the top. And so the center ones go here on the rudder. So again, using hot glue, just gonna put a, just a small dab there, squish it into place. And then there's another one here at the bottom. So again, a little bit of hot glue, just a dab. And I'll squeeze it into that depression molded into the foam. Now, the other two go on the wingtips. And so I'm going to do that. And uh, then we'll flip this over and we'll look at a couple of things that goes on the bottom. So up here we've got uh, the fairings for the exhaust pipes that come out of the, the motor. And again, I'm just going to use a little hot glue on this. Uh, there's not, it's not holding anything and the hot glue will be plenty sticky. Put it on the end, kind of twist it in. Put my finger over that to smooth it out. We've got one of them in. Do the same thing to the other, just a little glue. There we go. Now the next thing we have to do is just a little black plastic, uh, what I assume is a vent, going on the bottom. So again, put just a little glue on that. Get it in the hole, wipe the excess. And now we've got the bottom vent. And then last but not least, we've got the, uh, the pitot tube coming out of the end of the wing. Now the airplane's upside down and I want the tube coming out kind of toward the bottom of the wing. So I've got that fit like that. And again, I'm just gonna use a little hot glue. This one would go easy with, with CA, some epoxy, whatever you're, you wanna do. But for me and for my purposes, the hot glue is going to be just fine. And that was the last of the pieces that I needed to put on. Everything's looking good. Now it's time to check the CG. Now I've got a little CG machine that I often use for my smaller models to check the balance. Uh, this model was a little big for that to work effectively. And so I relied on the old standby. That is, I took a ruler, measured back 100 millimeters, as described in the instructions, and then just put a pin right there and there at the 100 meter mark, or the 100 millimeter mark, and then just reversed the airplane and held it up on my fingertips to get it to balance. Now, the first thing I noticed was that it was way nose heavy. So, as we discussed in the propeller assembly stage, that big heavy washer was the first thing to get taken off. Even after that, though, it was still heavy, and I ended up putting almost five ounces of weight here in the back against the back uh, wall of the cockpit to get it to balance at that 100 to 110 millimeter point. I don't like adding weight to models, but this one's going to have plenty of power, and even at that, with the battery I'm planning to use, it came in four ounces less than what the instructions suggest, so it came in just... Um, just a hair under six pounds. So uh, that all should work pretty well. 
One of the things I noticed when I was doing the CG work was getting in and out of the airplane was kind of uh, pain. Um, the little uh, plastic snaps that go over the pegs here on the fuselage are really tight, which is good for keeping it on in flight, but bad for taking it off here on the ground. As a result, what I did was I put a dowel and I just dug a little channel out with my hobby knife right where the, um, the foam changes directions, right at that crease. Dug it deep enough for the dowel to fit in, dropped in a little polyurethane glue this time, uh, pushed it in there, and then t painted the ends uh, to match the color of the foam, in this case white, to give me just a little bit of a nub. It's about a quarter of an inch. That way, when I try to take the canopy off, I can apply pressure, upward pressure, on these little nubs instead of pushing in on the foam uh, and running the risk of breaking this plastic canopy cover or collapsing the foam here on the corner. Now this is something I've done with a lot of models, so it's not unexpected, but it is a modification that I'd recommend to you. As you can see, you can just lift the canopy off with your fingertips this way without putting any pressure on the structure itself. And now for a couple of closing comments. All in all, the model went together fairly easily. In fact, setting up the camera shots took a lot longer than the assembly itself. With almost no glue used, the primary assembly was simple and straightforward. The fit and finish of the foam right out of the box was very good, and the use of nylon pin style hinges instead of the typical molded foam hinges was worth the extra assembly time. Now that it's all complete, I'm pretty pleased and I'm looking forward to getting it out to the flying field. That's not to say everything was perfect, however. First, the instructions are terrible. If this was your first foam plane, I could see how you might struggle here and there. Basically, the instructions show you a picture of a subassembly and say, do this. For those with some experience, however, there's little different from other models you've probably built before. Another fault is the decals. Unlike many models with fairly thick vinyl stickers, the Grobs graphics appear to be water slide decals. I had the chance to talk to Pete from Banana Hobby who said the complaints they get about this model focus primarily on the decals and their tendency to chip away. While not shown in the video, I plan to apply a couple of coats of water base polyurethane in hopes of giving the graphics some protection. As I mentioned earlier in the video, the connector board is handy, but the connections to the receiver require a little figuring out. A quick entry in the instructions would have helped a bunch. It really would have been really easy to get frustrated if I hadn't noticed the pin placement in the connectors and the Futaba receiver in the photo. Trying to unscramble channel assignments would have been crazy, and if you had mounted the propeller when directed, it would also have been dangerous. The canopy snaps are firm, which is great for flight security, but bad for trying to get it off without crushing the foam on the canopy's back corner. Placing a support stick, as shown, should help in that regard. It's something I've done with several models with tight-fitting canopies. If you've assembled foam models before, you've probably run into these issues before. Mostly they're a nuisance and are all easy to fix. To bring this video to a close, let's take this bird outside and do a video walk around and let it show its stuff. If you found this video helpful, 
please click on the thumbs up icon and be sure to hit the subscribe button to the RC Plainview channel to be notified when I post new videos. Thanks for watching.